On one second. everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, Developments in Health and Welfare Plans. My name is Amanda and Larry Grigine will be your presenter today. We'll be covering all of the legislative updates since our last legislative webinar, which was in June, which means we have a lot of information to go through. Don't worry if you don't catch everything. We're recording the webinar right now and we'll email you the video and the slides after the webinar ends. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, November 29th at 1 p.m. Central Time, and we'll be going over the new overtime regulations right before they go into effect for you. That's the beginning of our new webinar schedule, so keep an eye out for that. We have a lot of participants today, so I'm keeping the conference on mute. Larry will pause for questions periodically, and I'll unmute so you can ask them. If you prefer, you can also type them in the question box below, and I'll ask the questions for you. Other than that, please enjoy. Thank you very much, and appreciate it. Uh, as Amanda indicated, these are just the developments since late June of this year. Um, and um, the next slide goes through exactly what those changes are. So I'll be talking about, in detail, taxation of uh, wellness benefits. Um, something very interesting, the DOL increased penalties, and I'll go through which penalties have been increased. Some are on high pumping. I'll be talking about the EEOC provide sample uh, ADA notice. I'll explain what that, and I've given you a link with that um, notices, what it contains, and when you have to give it up. Um, I'll be talking about a proposal, which is not in, and I just want to make it clear, this is just a proposal, the changes to the Form 5500. Um, it won't go into effect right away. It'll go into effect in 2019 if, it, if it's accepted, and if it, they decide to go forward. And then uh, uh, also the IRS uh, announced proposed information reporting rules for guidance on HRAs and uh, TIA and solicitation. Um, HHS released two proposed notice of benefit and payment parameters. And those, this affects those of you who have insured products. Uh, there are certain changes. EOC clarifies wellness program. Um, earlier this year, the EOC released final regulations on wellness programs. And what they've done, those regulations are pretty detailed, and, and so they just issued a clarification, which I'll just spend a few minutes on. And then um, also the uh, IRS releases 2016, the final uh, 1094s and 1095s. Now, I'm just going to go through the changes, um, and I'll have a separate seminar in a few weeks about um, going through in detail what the, what the forms look like for 2016, there are some changes to them. Uh, just last week, the IRS uh, released benefit limitations for 2017. I'll be talking about that, and uh, it affects both health and welfare and pension. So just be uh, made aware of, of what the changes are for 2017. And finally, the, um, the IRS released final regulations on accepted benefit lifetime and annual limits and I'll be going through those. So let's get started. Um, wellness benefits have become a real popular topic. A lot of employers are using wellness benefits as a way of, of incentivizing employees uh, to get healthy. And there, um, many employers are being very creative. So, you know, there's a number of different rules and what makes it complicated there's uh, the IRS, DOL, EEOC, they're all involved uh, in wellness programs. And people have a tendency of forgetting that when you design a program and when you give an employee a benefit, you have to step back and make sure that um, and determine whether that benefit is taxable or not. That's extremely important. So generally, a wellness benefit does not qualify, if it does not qualify either as an eligible or medical expense under Code Section 213D or fringe benefit under Code Section 132, then it's taxable. So it has to fit under one of those two buckets. And just recently, the IRS released a memorandum, 2016-22031, uh, 
that basically put some meat on the bone, uh, discuss exactly when certain um, wellness payments would be taxable and untaxable. And, and this is extremely important. So if this says cash and non-cash incentives, payments and rewards paid to an employee are not includable in the employee's income merely because it's paid under a wellness program. For purposes of income and, and employment taxes, the following items are included in taxable income. So, for example, if, if you give cash, give it a small amount, 10 or $25, it doesn't matter. It would be taxable. Um, if you give non-cash rewards, but it's an incentive that doesn't normally um, be classified as medical care, which, which, and this is very popular, it would, would include payment of gym membership. Because uh, gym memberships and, and going to a gym, unless you are directed by a doctor, is considered to be general health and, and would not be uh, considered to be a medical expense in a code section to 213. Payment or reimbursement through a wellness program to reimburse employees to all part of the premiums. Now, uh, this is important because differentiate, you'll see this slide, which can get rather confusing. Um, if, if the employer organizes it as a reduction of the premium, then this last bullet doesn't apply. So it all depends how the employer um, organizes the payment. If it's a reimbursement of premium, it's taxable. If it's a reduction of premium, it's not taxable. So it's extremely important to understand. Um, also, uh, benefits and services uh, following are excluded uh, from, in, uh, uh, from taxable income. Benefits, services, and non-cash rewards and incentives that are medical care, for example, bio, uh, biometric screening, smoking cessation programs, health risk assessments, if you provide to those employees, those are considered to be medical care under 213. Also, rewards and incentives that qualify as a de minimis fringe, which could include you know, T-shirts or various small little things that you give out, for example, in a wellness fair. Uh, that comes under another code section, code section 132, and that would not be considered to be taxable. Uh, two other um, employer payments would be excluded, which would be group insurance payment reductions uh, paid as amounts rewards to employees who did not uh, who participate in or complete certified activities. Or, and again, this is a reduction of the uh, premium amount, and that's what I talked about. So. Um, if, if you organize it as a premium reduction as opposed to a reimbursement, the IRS said that as long as it's categorized as a premium reduction, it's not taxable. Now, some employers, if you participate in a wellness program, you get an HSA contribution, um, and those are employer contributions to an, uh, to an HSA plan. You do it through a cafeteria plan. In that situation, those payments would not be taxable either. So again, it's extremely important when you're organizing a wellness program. If you organize it in certain ways, uh, certain payments will not be taxable. Now next, let's look at um, the increase in DOL penalties. Uh, they increase penalties uh, for uh, under ERISA, under various uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, under the Family uh, Medical Leave Act. Uh, and these were effective uh, for civil penalties assessed after August 1st, 2016. Now, what I've done is I've given you a link to a uh, chart that was in the law, and I'll just uh, give you some idea of what uh, some of the amounts would be. Uh, for example, the failure to provide summary of benefits and coverage, the SPC, uh, was $1,000, now it's going up uh, $1,000 to $1,087. Failure to provide, a failure to, a failure to file a Form 5500 um, was $1,100 a day. Now it's going up to $2,063. So again, um, this is something that people are surprised at. It, and even at $1,100 a day was a huge penalty. Now it's $2,063. Now for any of you who haven't filed 5,500s, uh, please may, 
be made aware that there's a delinquent filer program that completely that reduces that penalty substantially. Uh, under that program, I can file a number of years penalties, and it's it's like four, three or four thousand dollars. So, um, so again, but if you get audited and the IRS, uh, the I'm mean, sorry, the DO co finds that you haven't filed 5,500s, the penalty can be rather severe, two thousand sixty-three dollars. And this is for any penalties assessed after April of 2016. Also, failure to provide documents uh, to the DOL upon request. Uh, it was uh, $110 per day, not to, not to exceed $1,100. That's going up to $147 per day, not to exceed $1,472. So again, these are uh, penalties that just apply to um, health and welfare plans. Uh, there's also penalties that apply to pension plans. But again, you have a chart there, and just click on that or insert that on your browser, and you can get the full range of penalties. Next of all, uh, the EOC provides a sample ADA notice. Uh, when the regulations came out a few months ago, the EOC indicated that if, if an employer is going to be testing and uses personal health information, uh, basically what you have to do is inform the employees of what you're doing. And they provided a sample notice uh, that goes into detail, about, um, and you can use that to inform the employee of the fact that, yes, you're going to be taking information under the wellness program, and it's going to be uh, used under the wellness program. It's protected, um, and so it's a requirement under the law that you, if you're actually doing testing and you're actually um, collecting personal health information, you have to give this notice. So, so long as the required information is provided, employers need to use the precise wording of the sample notice and may tailor their notices to the specific features of their wellness programs. Employers already provide notices under HIPAA may comply with the ADA rules by adding language to your current notices. There's a notice of privacy practices you can add a few words to in order to satisfy this. Notices may be provided in hard copy or by email, and employers with dis employees with disabilities may need to receive notices in alternative format. And then, and there's no, um, this requirement kicks in as of January 2017, and there's no specific time um, under the regulations that you have to give this. They just have to make sure. I would think that before you collect information, you would have to distribute this notice. Um, employers may contract with wellness providers to provide this notice. An employee signed authorization is not required for purpose of the AD rules but it may be in regard to HIPAA and GINA. Now, if you do a link there to the sample notice, you can look at it, but basically what it indicates, uh, and you're informing the employee that you are collecting personal health information, and you're indicating the notice how you're going to use it, under what circumstances you're going to use it, and you're going to indicate to the employee how you're protecting that information. So um, click on that link and look at it if you uh, if you are either have a wellness program or anticipating a wellness program this is something you have to distribute uh, agencies propose significant changes to 5500 now as I indicated to you earlier um, this is not going to affect to 2019 and again I just want to stress to you that these changes are just proposed it doesn't mean they've actually finalized this yet but the changes are pretty substantial. So increased group health obligations. The proposal would require 5,500 forms by all ERISA group health plans. Remember now, if you have under 100 employee participants, you don't have, you don't have to file a 5,500. If this uh, proposal is finalized, every uh, ERISA plan will have to file a 5,500. Including a new comprehensive news, J, group health information that will be included 
and this new Schedule J would indicate the types of health benefits offered and the funding method, including information about participant employee contributions and what the plan is insured uses the trust or pay these benefits from the uh, general assets. It would also include information about COBRA coverage, uh, insurer refunds, and would ask whether the plan claims grandfather status. So they're collecting uh, more information, and the reason why they're doing this is for audit purposes. There's increased emphasis for the DOL to get involved with, with compliance in regard to ACA and ERISA. So what a perfect way of doing it, and this is a perfect way of collecting information by using the 5500s, because right now there's a big hole in their compliance because companies that have less than 100 participants don't have a 5500, don't have to file a 5500. So again, the DOL, IRS, and PPGC have jointly proposed changes, and the DOL has proposed changes to ERISA reporting requirements to conform the regulations to propose form 5500. And again, it's going to, it's not going to be effective right away. It's going to be effective for the 2019 plan year, so it's a few years away. But these changes include a new uh, schedule for group health plans, found requirement group, group health plans that are currently exempt. Uh, and again, uh, so here it would require filing for those who haven't filed before. Um, and again, uh, this is extremely important. Uh, more information has to be collected. But again, wait for this because it, it may not come to, um, to any conclusion yet. Uh, a separate Schedule C would be filed for each service provider. Also, a Schedule C filing requirement would be extended to some of small plans exempt from filing there right now. And a new Schedule H would be expanded to include questions on fee disclosures, level uh, asset acquisitions, and uh, annual uh, fair market values, designated investment alternatives, investment managers. Those, I think, would probably more apply to, to uh, retirement plans. already covered that and, and again this is uh, these proposals I've just covered health and law but there's also proposals for retirement plans too so I mean so this is an horizon that's going to be changed this is the four fifty five hundreds okay um, and after this session uh, what I'll do I'll stop for questions the next um, topic is uh, the IRS proposes information reporting rules for guidance on HRAs and TIN solicitation. Uh, basically what this is indicating, these new proposed regs don't change anything and, and basically what they indicate is that if you have an integrated HRA, uh, there's no special reporting for that under the 1095B, 1095B or the um, 1095C form. This kind of codifies what's been in the instructions. So again, as long as your HRA is integrated, there's no uh, 1095 um, either B or C report separate reporting. That the only time that is true is that when you have a 1095, when you have an HRA, and you are reimbursing expenses for someone who's not participating in your plan, but under the spouse's plan. Also, for supplemental uh, coverage under this exception, uh, coverage under an HRA or other plan that is an MEC need not report for the individual if the individual is eligible for that supplemental coverage only if enrolled in other MEC programs. When this rule is applied to eligible employer-sponsored coverage, the supplemental coverage in the MEC program must be from the same employer, and there's no separate reporting. What's extremely important, and this should have to be looked at, and this has become a big issue with the 1095Cs, is a TIN solicitation. So other the proposed regs would clarify the requirement for soliciting a taxpayer uh, identification number of a covered employee and a waiver of related penalty for certain circumstances. So there's new procedures for missing TINs. There's, again, proposal according to proposed rules, penalties would be waived for missing TINs when a Filer acts in a, in a responsible manner by initiating, soliciting, and 
individual's TIN when the account is open. And this is, again, there's a procedure for that. And the first annual solicitation must be no later than 75 days after the date in which the account is open. There's also a second solicitation and there's a third solicitation, which is covered. Also, uh, transitional missing relief for individuals already enrolled in coverage. Uh, the preamble, the proposed regs, includes transitional role to ensure that the requirements for the first annual and second annual solicitations for missing IANs must be satisfied. Under this rule, July 29, 2016 is treated as account opening date, and the first solicitation must be at any time up to 75 days after July 29. There's another uh, procedure solicitation for incorrect TINs, which is extremely important, and this was a huge problem uh, for the 1095Cs. So the proposed regs would not modify any existing rules for incorrect TINs. In applying the existing rules for initial solicitations, the account is considered open for purpose of the incorrect TINs, and there's a procedure for soliciting incorrect GINs. The proposed rules would clarify that GIN solicitations made to the responsible individual who enrolls him or her and others and would be treated as a solicitation and to avoid penalties, a covered provider would have to solicit uh, GIN separately for any individual added to the policy or plan and preamble clarifies the rules. So stay tuned. I want to have something in regard to this because for 2015, finally, this was a huge problem. Also, HHS proposed new notice of benefit and payment parameters for 2018. Some of this applies to employers, but some of this applies to employees. Uh, some of this applies to insurance companies, but others apply to employers. So HHS released proposed regulations to include benefit and payment parameters. Um, they've announced increased annual cost sharing, and this is under um, ACA for out-of-pocket limits. For 2018, for individual coverage, it's a 63.50. For 2018, and $14,700. It was 71.50 and 14.3 for 2017. Uh, in 2018, the, IRA, the HHS has proposed an exchange standardized plan option at the bronze level that qualifies for the HSA eligible high deductible plan. Now, what this is important because previously the limits for ACA were different than for HSA. Now, in 2018, they decided to make the limits the same, which is extremely important. Uh, in regard to shop uh, enrollments, there's going to be uh, newly qualified individuals have a, a full 30 days to enroll. Qualified employers would have be, would be required to notify shop of a newly qualified employee out of before the 30th day after the, after the employee becomes eligible. And under a federal shop, the coverage effective dates for newly qualified employees will be the first day of the month following the plan selection and waiting periods under the shop cannot exceed 60 days. And then there's uh, retool insurance rules. Uh, under the small market, uh, age bands would now be four levels instead of three levels. Revisions to the guarantee renewability would reduce in instances where certain insurers may be inadvertently triggered by your prohibition. There's going to be new rules on medical loss ratios, as, as it indicates here. And insurers will also limit the total uh, medical loss ratio rebate liability payable in the calendar year in certain situations. So again, there's going to be change to this as we move forward. Let's stop right there. And Amanda, do we have any questions? We don't have any typed questions, but I'll unmute so anyone can ask. The conference has been unmuted. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody?
anybody have any questions? That's interesting, not at all. All right, you will all mute again. The conference has been muted. when these rules came out because the EOC rules were slightly different than the rules um, that were released under HIPAA. So it caused a lot of questions, a lot of um, concern. And what the EOC legal staff did has written an informal discussion letter clarifying the EOC's final regulations on wellness programs. And under this letter, they make some clarifications now in a situation where you have an employee and they have multiple options uh, to sign up for health plans. And the question was, okay, um, if you have multiple options, and let's say you have plan A, B, C, and D, when you're determining what the wellness, the maximum wellness benefit is, there are some questions of exactly um, how do you base that uh, wellness benefit? because it's 30%, but 30% of what? Um, and there are some questions about which one you would use. Out of this letter from the legal department at EEOC, they basically indicated that the maximum incentive is determined with the lowest cost option, even if that option is, is not the option that the employee actually enrolled. That's a clarification which is extremely important. And this interpretation promotes the consistency within the wellness program by making the incentive limit the same for all employees. Now, what caused confusion is that next bullet. This limit, this letter notes that this approach differs from the HIPAA rule, which asserts that the end result balances a desire of consistency between the statutes and the need to ensure that incentives are not coercive. So again, even though you're um, complying with the, the HIPAA rules, you may be violating the EOC guidance because they limit the amount uh, that, they, um, that the reward would be to the lowest option offered to the employee, even if that option is not the one that they enrolled in. Uh, in early October, the IRS released 2016 final 1094 and 1095 C forms. Uh, they also released the B's, but um, the B's weren't that, there weren't any changes in that. So, so please remember for 2016, all the different 1095 forms are due uh, to be distributed to the employees uh, by January 31st of 2017. So far, there's not going to be any extensions. So your payroll department is going to be fairly busy because it's the same date, I don't know why they did this, that you have to issue the employees the W-2s. So the employees will have to get a copy of the 1095-Cs or Bs and the W-2s at the same time. Also, the old um, deadlines that were originally in 2015, now apply in 2016. The 1094C and the, and the copies of the 1095C will be, uh, again, if you're filing paper, uh, they're due on February 28th, and if you're filing electronically, they're due on March 31st, 2017. Now again, um, if you're filing 250 or more 1095Cs, you have to do it electronically. And please remember the um, requirement to file a 1095C is based on your um, employee level as of the average in 2015. So if, if you're looking at your average and you're considered an applicable large employer for 2015, you have to file in 2016 and you have to file a 1095C. So again, it's an average over calendar year 2015. That applies for 2016. 
So again, any transition relief has been discontinued or limited. Um, if you look at the 1094C form, box 22, formally qualifying offer transition relief has been marked reserved. In line 22, there was a box, box C called Section uh, 4980H Transition Relief. Please remember that this only applies for those months in 2016 in which your 2000, the plan year that started in 2015 and in 2016. So no longer can you get any relief for, for all of 2016. Um, now, the 1094C form is extremely important because it determines liability for the penalty, for the $3,000 penalty, so you've got to be very careful. And transition relief that was specific for 2015 has been discontinued or limited. So again, code 1L or 1I and, and line 14 has been marked reserved. And 2L and 2I, under line 14, say part were formerly for non-calendar year plans, has been marked reserved. So those codes have been eliminated for 2016. Now there's new, there's two new codes um, in line 14, uh, 1J and 1K. And those codes are important because one is for, in both situations, they apply to uh, conditional offers offered to in spouses. In one situation, you offering coverage uh, to the dependent children. In another situation, you're not. But in both situations, what you're doing is you're offering a continual, a, a conditional offer of coverage to the employee and, and those what we call spousal carve outs are, are extremely important. The conditional offer is we're going to offer you coverage only if, if you don't have coverage any other place. And for the first time in 2016, the 1095, uh, 1095C is going to reflect that. So please remember there's two new codes. So again, offer is subject to one or more reasonable objective conditions. For example, coverage is only available upon proof that the spouse is not eligible for coverage under the spouse's, under their spouse's employer plan. So that's why they call it a continual offers. So it is a valid offer even if the conditions are not met. So extremely important. So again, um, for 2016, the employer must offer an MEC plan, minimal essential coverage, to at least 95% of their full-time employees, less 30 employees, and use a Series 2 code of affordability rules. Thus, an employer that checked no for any month in 2000 uh, in Form 1094C Part 2, Column A, cannot use the Safe Harbor Code for the same month and do not use code 2C for any month if the employee enrolled in coverage was less than an MEC program. And you must count employee as full-time if the employer met the definition from uh, full-time for any day of the month under either the monthly measurement period or the look-back method. So again, if anybody is in, um, and here and especially in column A of the 1094C, if you're under a safe harbor method, please remember the 95% jumps down to 70%, but only for those months that apply to the 2015 year that started in 2015 and then went over in 2016. So again, this form has not get less complicated. Uh, it's still complicated, and again, it's extremely important. That was also very important uh, the good faith compliance exception no longer applies in 2016. It only applied for 2015. And this echoes what I just said. The IRS 
allowed for good faith uh, relief for t uh, timely filed but incomplete or incorrect uh, for to the, the, the 2015 filing. But the good faith relief no longer applies to 2016. And please remember that the penalties for either later incomplete forms will apply, and they went up this year. Um, 2000, it's got now going instead of being 250 a form, it's going to be 260 uh, with a limit of uh, three million one hundred and ninety three dollars as your maximum penalty. Now, please remember that if a mistake is made because of a reasonable cause, you can still allege that, but the good faith compliance exception no longer applies. Uh, just a few days ago, the IRS released a benefit limitations for 2017. So in 2017, uh, for 2017, these are, and again, these COLA limits apply for plan years beginning in 2017. For health FSAs for 2017, that limit applies, it's $2,600, increase of $50. The qualified transportation fringe, it's $255, again, for parking and another $255 for transit passes and van, van pooling. So again, these are effective for any plan years beginning in 2017. There's also uh, adoption assistance exclusion. Um, the limit is increased $110 to 13570 In addition, the maximum adoption limit um, increased to 13570 both the exclusion and credit uh, phased in for individuals for adjusted gross incomes of 203 to uh, 540. Uh, so these are important limits for 2017. A few days uh, also for DCAPs, it's still uh, 5,000 and 2,500. Um, in regard to the small business uh, health care tax credit for 2017, it has been increased $300 to um, $26,200, and for maximum annual wages uh, for eligible for small employer has increased uh, to $52,400, increase of $600 from the 2016 limit. Now, in addition to these limits, they also um, increased the limits for help uh, for retirement plans. 401k, 403b, and 457 plan. And as you look at this list, you can see not that many limits uh, increased for 2017. The maximum employee elective deferral was not increased. Also, the catch-up contribution was not increased. Uh, for, for the 450 limit for defined contribution plans were, were increased from 53,000 to 54,000. The defined contribution maximum limit for age 50 or older went from 59,000 to 60,000. The employee contribution limit for calculating contributions went from 265,000 to 70. And the um, compensation for key employees, this is important for testing, um, for top heavy testing and also testing under cafeteria plans, increased from 170,000 to 175,000. And, but the limit for highly compensated has not increased. It stays at $120,000. Also, final regulations for ex accepted benefits, lifetime limit and annual limits. Uh, now, this definition is extremely important. The final regulations incorporate the prior um, frequently asked question guidance. And, and these accepted benefits are extremely important because um, this is a definition under HIPAA. And here, if you're considered to be an, an accepted benefit, um, then many of the uh, health care reform, reform changes don't apply to that. So the um, essential health benefit definition for purposes of lifetime limit, the regulations amend the definition of essential health benefit purposes for the prohibition of lifetime and annual limits. 
while the employer-sponsored self-insured plans and large are not required to cover essential health benefits. They may not impose any annual lifetime limits. And the amendment is to intended to ensure that plans that use a complete, a complete definition of essential health benefits consistent with the specified benchmark plans as needed to comply with this and included in state required uh, benefit mandates. So again, here in that situation, you don't have to offer essential health benefits. But if you do, uh, there's no lifetime and annual limit. Also, for short-term and limited duration insurance in this situation, the regulations revise the definition of short-term and limited duration coverage by reducing the duration to less than three months. Again, there's an exception in this situation. Are there any additional questions? I don't have any types. Amanda, do we, have, did, did we get any questions? I don't have any types, but I'm going to unmute the conference so anybody can ask. The conference has been unmuted. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question in regards to the 1095C. Mm -hmm. when, when we have um, an employee that is hired, the benefits aren't eligible until the 90, 90 days after. And if it's mid-month that that 90 days starts on, um, how do we complete that month's box? Uh, it's basically... It's going to be code 2D. There's still a limited assessment period. In order to use okay. the 2C, they have to, they have to have coverage for the entire month. Okay. So in that situation, you, you would use code 2D. All right. So if there's not coverage for the entire month, then it needs to be 2D. Correct. Or 2, yeah, 2D. Even though they were offered, like... When they're hired, they're told, yes, you're going to have benefits, but they don't kick in until day 91. Right, and, and I think the reason why is because the, the rewards are determined at the beginning of the month, especially for the uh, subsidies, and so they'll be entitled to reward at the beginning of the month, and it doesn't matter that coverage um, at the middle of the month. Okay, thank you. Sure. Now, and now remember, in this situation, uh, these codes are extremely important to understand. And the biggest problem you're going to have, in, and this was a problem last year and it will be, be continued to be a problem this year, is that as they keep on changing codes, and they're, gonna, and they're going to retire codes and put new codes in, uh, the problem is going to be explaining what that form means to your employees. The biggest question I get in regard to employees and 1095Cs and 1095Bs is what do I do with this form? Do I have to attach it to my 1040? And the answer is no. Uh, so please make sure you inform your employees of what this form is and what it does. And basically it's to, uh, and the purpose behind the form is to inform the employees when they're offered coverage now, it got messed up last year because of the fact they extended the deadlines. But the purpose behind the form, the 1095C form, is to inform the employees of when they were offered coverage so when they claim any type of subsidies on their tax return when they file it in April of 2017, they'll have something in their hand to say, oh, I can claim this subsidy for these months because I was offered coverage. Last year, uh, it was filed too late to be um, any type of effect, and it was lost on that. It was just a big mess. This year, hopefully, they don't change the deadlines again. Employees will have it in their possession, but they have to understand what they're looking at and what it means. And that's going to be still a big problem because you have to explain to the employees what the codes actually mean. So please understand that. Are there any other questions? Anybody else? Okay, thank you everybody. I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to have another seminar on November 29th. We're going to talk about the uh, overtime rules. You should be getting notice about that in the next few days. And especially what we're going to do is explain how these new overtime rules affect you and your benefits and how you're offering coverage to benefits. So please understand that. 
again, thank you very much, and we'll see you in a few weeks. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, Larry.